We will begin the program in one minute. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Happy Canada Day and happy also day of USMCA implementation. It's a big day. And welcome back to the 2020 Washington Conference on the Americas. My name is Eric Farnsworth and as the Vice President and Head of the Washington Office of the Council of the Americas, I'm very pleased once again to be able to welcome all of you for this very important session that we're hosting today. Our plenary speaker is the President of the World Bank Group, David Malpass, and our session will be led by Council President and CEO, Susan Siegel. It is no exaggeration to say that we rely on our sponsors to make this event possible. Our presenting platinum sponsors this year are Chevron, General Motors, and Merck Inventing. And our gold sponsors are Chiquita Brands, Freeport McMoran, Integra Capital, MetLife, Principal Financial Group, Repsol, and Sempra Energy, and our media partner once again is the Financial Times. This is a live webcast event, so those who care to uh, be tweeting, please use, use the hashtag 2020WCA. To kick us off today, we have a short three-minute video for your en enjoyment, followed by our session with President Malpass. During the session, all mics will be muted. For those on WebEx, should you have a question for the World Bank president, please send it via the Q&A function, and please make sure you provide your name and your affiliation. Address the question, please, to the host, who will be the only person monitoring this function. And you can find the Q&A function in your menu bar in the circle with three dots. Ladies and gentlemen, to begin our conference video. Hi, I'm Chris Landau, the U.S. Ambassador to Mexico. It gives me great pleasure and pride to welcome you to the Council of the Americas Annual Washington Conference. As many of you know, my late father, George Landau, was the Council's president for eight years and a huge believer in its mission. He passed on that belief to me. I can think of nothing more important to the prosperity and the security of our hemisphere than promoting the role of the U.S. private sector. There have been many government programs over the years, but no government program can possibly have the impact of private investment. So I'm delighted that you were able to make this May conference work, even if it isn't in May. This conference provides an invaluable forum for the private sector and government officials to meet, to discuss issues of mutual concern, to set agendas, and to force action. Although the conference, like so much else, is virtual this year, I'm still confident that the crucial dialogue and networking can take place. Let me just say a word about David Rockefeller, this council's illustrious former chairman. He's one of the people that I've met in my life whom I most admire. He didn't have to work a day in his life, but work he did, and he was passionate 
about closer ties between the U.S. and Latin America. I don't think the council would exist, but for his vision and passion. And he certainly inspired my father to leave the Foreign Service to work with him in this organization. My father both admired and liked him, and they continued to keep in close touch until David's death in 2017. You all at the council have a proud legacy of people like David Rockefeller and George Landau, and I'm totally committed to working with you to keep that legacy alive. In particular, I'd like all of you to know that you have a strong ally in me. Mission Mexico, the embassy in Mexico City, and nine consulates general stands ready, willing, and able to work with you on investments in Mexico. This is a rich country that needs investment, so there are many win-win scenarios. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words and enjoy the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, the President and CEO of the Council of the Americas, Susan Siegel. Well, thank you, Eric. And thank you very much to the team that put this conference together. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce our second spe speaker of this virtual Washington Conference on the Americas, David Malpass, President of the World Bank. President Malpass, David, it is a real honor to have us with you today. There is no global institution more to getting us through the current crisis than the World Bank. Under David's leadership, the World Bank took an early leading role in addressing the consequences of the pandemic with a commitment to provide up to 160 billion in financing over 15 months to recover from health economic and social shocks being felt around the globe. It has become clear to all of us that the effects are going to be more serious and longer lasting than we had first hoped. Governments everywhere, including in the Americas, are looking to the World Bank for its expertise and leadership as they seek to mitigate the effects of the crisis and move towards a sustainable inclusive recovery. David is well known both in New York and Washington, of course, but this year we have people joining us from around the globe and it's worth reminding everyone of his distinguished background. Before serving as the World Bank president about 15 months ago, David served as undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs. He has held a number of other very senior positions in the U.S. government and Congress, and he has always been deeply involved and devoted to Latin America and Latin American issues along the way. He has also had extensive private sector uh, experience, particularly important for us. He was a of the American. Let me thank you again, President Malpass, for joining us. David, you need to unmute your phone. Okay, I'm, I'm unmuted. I'm gonna go off camera for a minute or you were coming in and out. I apologize for that. Uh, let me try this and then I'll uh, start. Um, Okay, can you hear me, Susan? How's this sound? Hmm? It sounds great, and we can hear you. Okay, good. I'll I'll uh, launch. And sorry, I was uh, I was it, it, I, I lost Susan there at the end. 
Well, I want to say uh, a very warm hello to Eric, uh, to Susan. Uh, I enjoyed watching Chris Landau. I miss George Landau and David Rockefeller and was so glad to hear the mention of them uh, in, uh, in Chris's uh, remarks. Let me begin by saying that it's great to be back uh, at the Washington Conference on the Americas. It's been one of the most dependable value added events in Washington with a focus on achieving success uh, for all the people of the Western Hemisphere. I'd also like to begin with a thank you to the United States for being the host country for this event and for hosting so many of our organizations, including the World Bank, of which I'm honored to be the president. Also the Inter-American Development Bank and the Organization of American States, which are so important to the region. Uh, the Council of the Americas that sponsors this conference and where I was grateful to be a member and on the board of directors and friends with, uh, with many of the people we've mentioned already today. And of course, uh, the host to the US State Department where this event is normally held and which I enjoyed to going uh, over the years. I've named just a few of the anchors uh, for this event. There are many others. The freedom and security that we enjoy here today is a key part of the effectiveness of our organizations. And I wanted to open with that acknowledgement. When I started attending this conference in the 1980s, it was already a must attend event for those working on the region's daunting financial problems and development. I'm glad to be here today, though I'm deeply saddened that it is again a very difficult time for Latin America and the Caribbean. I started traveling in Mexico and Central America in the 1970s, overland in those days, and began working for the US government on regional issues in 1984. There was important follow-up to the Kissinger Commission report on Central America, as well as country and regional aid programs, the multilateral engagement, and the ever-present need for macro and microeconomic reforms, for growth, and for more resources. Uh, as at the US Treasury, I worked on the Latin debt crisis, traveled with Secretary Baker to the Antigua Summit of Regional Leaders in 1987, and supported him on the trade legislation that enabled the Canada Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and the successful Chile Free Trade Agreement. As Treasury's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Developing Nations, I testified uh, to Congress on the positive changes underway at the World Bank on the environment and on the very constructive leadership transition at IDB from President Ortiz Mena to President Enrique Iglesias. With Secretary Brady joining the Reagan and then Bush 41 administrations, the Brady Plan enabled securitization of the syndicated bank loans that were weighing on the region and the legal system. In 1990, I moved to the State Department as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Latin American Economic Affairs and pushed forward the Enterprise for the Americas initiative that pursued debt for nature swaps and regional trade and development initiatives such as the Caribbean Basin Initiative and IRS Section 936 benefits. Uh, crises were frequent, including Haiti, Panama, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Peru, and more, but none of the challenges were as widespread as those the region is facing today. More recently, as Undersecretary at the U.S. Treasury in 2017 and 2018, I was pleased to help launch the America Cresce initiative aimed at growth in the Americas, which is working to expand growth, energy, electricity, and infrastructure. And we completed the U.S. portion of the capital increase for the World Bank and IFC and continued the major IDA funding that is so important for the world's poorest countries. Since October 2017, the G20 and IMFC communiques have included an important new phrase regarding growth, which I'll read. Uh, Strong fundamentals and sound policies and a resilient international monetary system are essential to the stability of exchange rates, contributing to strong and sustainable growth and investment. 
That's in every communique now. This close linkage of fundamentals, exchange rate stability, and sustainable growth is at the core of the resilient recovery that we all desire. I know that's too many details on Latin American history and my work on Latin America, TMI, as my kids say, too much information. But I wanted to share some details in part because we need to look for meaningful actions and initiatives now, steps that will mitigate the hammer blow of this pandemic and help build a strong, resilient recovery. It's clear that international cooperation needs to be strengthened on finance, growth, development, and political progress. I'll describe our World Bank efforts in a moment, but first off, we should recognize the current environment. For Latin America, recent decades had been significant, had seen significant improvements in health with large reductions in infant and maternal mortality and gains in health service coverage and affordability. Education had seen advances with improvements in access and enrollment. The poverty rate had fallen from 43% in 2003 to 24% in 2018. But even before the pandemic, Latin America was hit hard by the global slowdown with private sectors under pressure, inequality widening, and political systems showing fragility. Global growth has slowed, uh, had slowed significantly in the year before the pandemic, and many countries in Europe were already in recession. The stimulus programs in many of the advanced economies were generating only a narrow set of winners. With the pandemic, it's a perfect storm of external and domestic shocks. Output losses among the G7 countries and China are leading to lower export demand and lower commodity prices. Tourism has collapsed, dealing a severe blow. In financial markets, the flight to safety has confronted many countries with lost access to financial markets and higher borrowing costs. Our World Bank economists are projecting a contraction in Latin America's GDP of over 7% in 2020. This is the worst contraction since the start of reliable data in 1901, deeper than the Great Depression and much deeper than the Latin debt crisis or the 2008 recession. It hits the poor and vulnerable the hardest through illnesses, job and income losses, food supply disruptions, school closures, and lower remittance flows. And the poverty rate, which had been falling since the early 2000s, will go up significantly as tens of millions of people lose their jobs. I mentioned having participated in the Antigua summit in Guatemala in 1987, a core value for the region at that summit and now is democracy and the rule of law. It provides the path to higher living standards and to the freedoms we cherish. Yet political systems were fragile before the pandemic and will be severely challenged now. So what's the World Bank doing? Uh, I, I won't go through all of the details, but as you may know, we've been addressing the health crisis with immediate and broad support, reaching 104 countries worldwide. Uh, we're maintaining a line of sight to the long-term development mission. We work with the IMF and the IDB uh, to, to uh, provide support to the region in terms of preserving livelihoods and saving lives uh, through the health assistance. And we also have a big technical assistance program we're also working to limit the harm uh, so that uh, private sectors can be maintained uh, and people can work through uh, the, the pandemic and the crisis and be prepared for a recovery on the other side. Um, importantly, trans transparency of all government financial commitments uh, is, is going to be critical in creating the uh, attractive investment climates that could make substantial progress this year. And moving forward, the region, I think, has to and should work to strengthen policies, institutions, and investments uh, directed at achieving higher incomes for everyone, especially the poor, 
uh, and achieving more resilient, uh, sustainable uh, growth for the region. Uh, I'd like to mention uh, before concluding the some important personnel changes at the World Bank. As many of you know, Axel von Trotzenberg became managing director for operations, replacing Kristalina Georgieva as she moved to the IMF. He was the uh, vice president for Latin America. He's been uh, uh, replaced by Carlos Felipe Jaramillo. Many of you know him uh, and uh, he's vice president for Latin America and the Caribbean now. And I hope that you will get a chance to uh, meet him as he works with me, with Axel, with other World Bank uh, and IFC managers on the issues that I've been discussing. So to conclude, there's no doubt that the health and economic challenges facing Latin America and the Caribbean are vast and the risks are great. The World Bank is eager to work with countries across the region to respond to the crisis and build a strong recovery process. Our hope is that people in the region make strong gains in living standards in the next decade, future generations prosperity will depend on bold action now. The World Bank Group stands ready to help our clients move their country and regional goals forward. With that, I'll turn back to Susan, and it's so nice to see you and everyone else on the call today. It's good to be back at the uh, conference. Well, number one, David, thank you so much uh, for those remarks, and um, you bring back the memories of the Brady Initiative and the Baker Initiative where we work so closely together. And so thank you uh, for joining us. And we look forward, we work closely with Axel and we very much look forward to working uh, with Carlos Felipe who we've already started to work with. So thank you for mentioning them as well. Um, let's start by talking a little bit, estimates for world growth are really challenging in 2020 and 2021. Um, even though we think in 2021 there'll be growth, it won't take us to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, so how do you see, you know, how do we stimulate growth specifically in your mind, uh, world growth and Latin American growth? Because in fact, they're very linked. Um, you know, so how are we gonna do this? Uh, it's going to be hard. Um, so let me one one side note on the numbers. You know, as people as as the the world shrinks uh, by five percent or some some number in 20, uh, 2020, then there will be growth on the other side. But the problem is the world GDP won't recover uh, to the to the previous level for many years. And so, from the standpoint of employment and jobs, it's a loss that will be long lasting. And uh, it depends, of course, even to get back onto a growth path is going to take some progress from where we've been. Uh, and you're exactly right, Latin America, or and really the whole developing world is quite dependent on growth in the advanced economies. I've, I've been concerned and written about the inequality that had been arising in the, in the programs uh, of the advanced economies even prior to the pandemic, and I think it's exacerbated now with the pandemic because uh, you not only have the slowdown, but the slowdown ends up being focused on people in the bottom half of the income scale. For example, the informal sector doesn't have social safety net uh, that protects it. In the advanced economies, there's quite a bit of protection for people through unemployment insurance, for example, which doesn't exist for uh, the, the for the poorest uh, uh, in in the world, so we have this double whammy of a recession plus a uh, a recession that's aimed toward more inequality, not less. And I wanted I I think I should make a mention that what the stimulus programs are doing in the advanced economies, both the fiscal stimulus and the central bank stimulus often is benefiting the top half of the income scale, not the bottom half. For example, the central banks are buying uh, assets 
that are by and large owned uh, by by upper income people or are are uh, issued and underwritten by upper income people with the benefits from those bond offerings uh, going to upper income people. And so we have a distinct uh, program in the US, Japan and Europe that buys assets that are uh, that benefit the upper end of the income scale, not so much the lower end. And so this adds a uh, kind of a triple set of uh, inequality pressures that we need to be aware of. So turning to Latin America, then I, you know, having said all of that as a background, I really think it's important to look at each country program and say countries have, uh, you know, I, I argue against the idea of there being destiny in the world or there being fate uh, that it, we're not fated to go in one direction. It'll be very important what Mexico decides to do in terms of its economic policies. Um, it has this huge benefit of a free trade agreement with the United States, which is in whatever world scenario you have is probably going to be one of the major uh, engines of, of growth. Even if it doesn't have a strong recovery still, it's the world's biggest economy and Mexico is, a ta is it can benefit from that. So uh, I wanna almost break it down into, it depends a lot on what each country does. What does Colombia do? What does Brazil do, Argentina, Chile, and uh, uh, across the region? And each island, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's choice for the islands in the Caribbean because they can, uh, uh, main, uh, they can begin to rebuild the tourism industry. They can build an agricultural industry and a trade trade uh, industry that we've all worked so hard to uh, try to help them uh, create in the first place, setting up the, the measures that can rebuild it. I went on, Susan, but I, that's the key question facing us all. So let's tackle it. Uh, yeah, I agree. And in fact, Rodrigo Contreras asks, what would be the focus of the measures to help recovery in Latin America in midst of the pandemic, which is a follow on to that question. Thank you, Raul. Uh, Rodrigo, pardon. And Susan, you know a lot of these. So one of the steps that I think is important is allowing a restructuring when there are business failures. One of the th one of the things we want to avoid is legal systems that freeze. Um, I mentioned in my re remarks a bit the 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 uh, uh, idea uh, of that. We know the world's going to be different after the pandemic. So economics will tell us that there has to be a flow of capital from the old sectors to the new sectors. Absolutely. We don't know yet what all the new sectors are. But if we try to lock in capital into the old sectors, meaning uh, maybe a, a, a hotel that's uh, totally dependent on tourism that's not going to return or whatever the asset is, if we lock that in, we, there won't be enough capital to build into the future. So we have to allow and set up systems that have some kind of legal process to allow capital to move, that's critical. And the same is true of labor. If you think of labor mobility, that's going to be vital. Governments can't create all the jobs that are needed for the people that are losing their jobs now. So there can be some kind of temporary measures now, but looking over the one, two, three year time frame, there has to be a flow of labor from old or from from jobs that 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 didn't survive the pandemic to jobs that need to be created in the new in the new world. So I think that's if I if I think about what primary thing can we help countries do, it's recognized that that changes in they can't stop it. So they have to find systems that embrace it. Well, you've raised a really interesting point, David, and that is jobs of the future. And so is the World Bank involved in job training in Latin America? Do you have a lot of, because this is also um, social development, which is one of your main um, themes uh, in terms of support going forward. There are some job training programs. Often we find that uh, the private sector wants to train people for jobs, but finds obstacles in their way. I don't mean for-profit education. I'm talking about the very hands-on job training of the companies that want to be allowed to hire a worker, train them, and then and then uh, give them a contract or keep them on. 
Uh, and so one of the things that IFC, the International Finance Corporation does, is tries to work with companies that seem to be good at training workers and bringing along new workers. So that's one approach. But we also find, and I guess I'll mention the importance of the basic education system of the countries. What I hear from, uh, from companies and from governments the most is the education system isn't, isn't giving us children who have the basics uh, well enough to, uh, uh, to integrate into, into jo the job economy. So I think that we need to work on. COVID is a big problem because it's sent so many children home and they fall, you know, the tendency is to fall backwards if you're not in school. So one of the key uh, recovery steps that we're trying to work on is to find ways that kids can come back to school safely uh, so that they so that they're ready for a job when they come out of school. Well, that's really interesting because uh, Angel Melguizo from AT&T Latin America says a key driver is digital connectivity. What are your insights on connecting SMEs, bridging social economic digital gaps and fostering e-education and e-government? The World Bank, uh, uh, I, I, so I talked with Prime Minister Modi about that. You know, India is a big, uh, uh, big education center, um, and uh, uh, and around the world, people want uh, this kind of progress to advances in digital connectivity. So I. I have to go to the, you know, you have to break it down country by country and, and maybe regions can come together. There's progress, the progress is really uneven. And when you strip it away, uh, one of the critical things is the telecom system in, in given countries. Some of them are, are really not moving quickly enough, are blocked maybe by monopoly power or vested interests. So we, we need to uh, set high standards that the world is moving so fast on technology that we need to be uh, able to allow that. Countries need to step forward and say, I don't understand why my country doesn't have broadband even in the in the in in you know city urban areas, uh, and I want it fixed you know in the next six months, not in the next six years. Um, so put setting high standards and really pushing forward because it's so um, critical. Uh, each time I dig, you know, we do the World Bank does a huge amount of work in this area, and so I could name we're involved in Pakistan and in Ethiopia and in uh, countries around the world uh, in uh, trying to help them get to a better, uh, better connectivity system. In Africa, often the electricity system is a uh, is a big problem that they don't have. 24/7 power in Latin America. That's less of a problem, but the telecom, the the advances uh, need to be more. So I guess the thought I'll leave with you is: we should all in the, that are on this call today set high standards. You, you know, the potential is there, and we shouldn't take uh, kind of delay delays as being somehow normal. They have to be overcome. And. You know, we have another question here from Maria Luisa Bols of uh, UPS, and she asks, what opportunities uh, do you see for Latin America coming out of the pandemic? Are there any interesting opportunities that you see in particular? I've I've avoided using the word opportunity because it's a catastrophe. And so I, I know what people mean when they say, you know, what uh, opportunity comes from from crisis. Um, and so I guess the way I would like to phrase that is uh, how can how can we move ahead in an effective way, accepting the idea, the, the knowledge that we are in an, a, a total catastrophe? So as if we can phrase it that way, then I, I, I really think the advances in digital connectivity are uh, should be are staring us in the face. Everyone who is at home is using uh, some kind of connectivity and uh, and or wants to. And so uh, that's one. Uh, another one is, um, you know, being recognizing that uh, Private, private sector is adaptable. And so I mentioned the need to allow capital and labor to flow. Uh, and so that's an opportunity. Countries can say, 
You know, we kind of had blockages that if there was a bankruptcy, it went into our legal system and died for five years. But we're going to find a fast track that allows at least small claims to go through faster. Let's say that as an example. And so I think you'd almost need to go down uh, uh, country by country and say, where is the opportunity uh, to, and I use that word opportunity, to to make a change in the system that wasn't available before. One that we've looked at in the, or I'll give you two that we're working, that we're looking at uh, around the developing world. One is to strengthen the social safety nets. So this is a time when a lot of people really need that small amount of assistance that can come through digital cash systems, for example. Uh, and the World Bank is, uh, you know, ver is very available to help fund those systems. Uh, so that's that's uh, uh, one. And then an, another is with oil prices lower and you know natural gas prices are lower, the, the argument for subsidies uh, that, that have been so prevalent, including in Latin America, subsidies to people to hold down the price of oil uh, or the pri price of cooking fuels and so on, that, that is lessened now. So this is an op opportunity for countries to do away with the subsidy systems that were so expensive in the past. David, can I follow up? And in your comments, and I totally agree with this, you talked about democracy and rule of law. And I think one of the great things that's happened in Latin America is the strengthening of democracy and, 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 and rule of law, particularly in some countries. But do you worry coming out of 2008 economic crisis, 2009, there was a surge of populism in some countries moving away from some of the more traditional the path that we, the Bretton Woods path, let's say, do you worry that if we don't, with such a sharp downturn and such a put it, catastrophe, the impact on 50% of the population from a social perspective is gonna be so um, intense. Do you worry about, about the political impact of that and how can we avoid a political impact? Uh -huh. Yes, I do, I do worry about that. And I mentioned and maybe went on too long about the inequality pressures that yes. uh, that were being allowed to build and now have been worsened by the pandemic. This is a big problem. So the, I think the solution we know is uh, to trust human beings. The human nature is very positive and it wants to have live within a society that has uh, a rule that benefit the people. Uh, the people. And so uh, I really think we need to redouble our vigor in terms of uh, 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 basic uh, moral ideas within countries. And as, as, as we know, Latin America has a very strong pervasive moral fiber uh, that can be built on in times of crisis. So leaders that can, uh, that can, can uh, tap into that, uh, that inherent goodness of, uh, of people. And then, and then now I'm gonna turn to the economic side. We have to find a way to stop the unfairness in the system that benefits the people uh, or that provides the subsidies and the monopolies and the, the barriers to entry uh, that keep people down. And we have to be have a system that's more openly embracing to newcomers. That means women, that means new small businesses, that means education for girls, that means uh, the digital, uh, by having digital transactions, you can lower the cost and cut out the banks, which often are, are an obstacle. I'll tell you a story way back. I went to Bolivia in the 1980s, so dating myself, but the banking system, What you remember when Peru had, was opening its banking system to competition and how, uh, how empowering that was to small businesses in Peru. And so the question was, could Bolivia do that? And the answer was, yes, they could, but they weren't gonna, they didn't do it. Uh, and so you found a closed banking system that blocked people and, push them toward populism. So I think we need to be really forceful uh, in, in our view that, uh, uh, that, that people have to bring down the barriers that are, per, that are blocking people from getting into the system. So we have a question, a little bit of feedback for you from Nicole from the El Salvadorian Embassy. 
she hears companies are telling her that the IFC is very risk averse and therefore not really looking at projects um, that, you know, they're looking only for totally bankable projects as opposed to projects that might not be quite bankable. Um, are you trying to change that? Do you see the same thing from the inside? The um, I do see that and, and, and recognize that there is a problem in that IFC um, uh, takes losses, they're not protected. And so when you say risk averse, then it gets very specific into how many, how many uh, hundreds of millions of dollars is it fair and is it responsible to risk and to possibly lose? Because unlike the, uh, the World Bank, so the the IBRD and IDA work with sovereign governments and have a, have a great deal of protection through preferred creditor treatment along with the IMF. So these lenders are have protection. IFC doesn't, uh, and so that gives it a natural risk aversion. So one thing we're doing to try to change uh, or respond to the questioner uh, is. Um, uh, uh, IFC is is we're we're doing what we call IFC 3.0, meaning the new form of IFC is for them to help build the private sector by by helping countries uh, identify what could be done to improve the business climate. And then IFC has a tight relationship with the with the rest of the World Bank, where you can work to get changes in law that will enable the private sector. So if the questioner says, uh, why doesn't the, the IFC invest more in Salvadorian businesses? A problem is it doesn't have all that much money. And one of its jobs is to try to help create a private sector system that's more robust. So we're working very actively, meaning I work every day on that part of IFC. But as far as whether it can go into a lower rated credit situation, um, now, the problem is, you know, the risk aversion is a natural tendency. Thank you very much uh, for that explanation. So Judy Brown from Rio Tinto asks, large scale infrastructure projects, including mining, are catalysts for development and a key uh, to the low carbon future. What's the role of the World Bank in this key economic driver? Great question. Uh, yes, this has uh, been a political question over the years, and I, I'm not going to give a very straight answer to that. We're looking, we, you, we, we are looking at uh, uh, businesses and sectors in countries that provide uh, that provide opportunity to for 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 scalable jobs and benefits. And so she, the, or that that question, that point was, what about the mining sector? You know, it has sizable environmental challenges, and the World Bank and IFC have both become. Uh, uh, there, there are many, many layers of regulatory policy inside the World Bank and IFC that make mining particularly challenging. There's not, uh, there's not a. Uh, W w w w there's not an opposition to it, but it's hard for mines to clear the environmental uh, hurdles that are that are that are inside and necessary. I mentioned in my remarks, you know, I testified in the 1980s on the the World Bank uh, with with urging from the U.S. had set up an environmental division. Prior to that, they didn't have an actual division. Uh, and it it uh, became stronger and stronger within the bank and following good, you know, it's what people in the world want as far as good environmental policy. Uh, so it's been, uh, but what that means is that certain types of mining are just very hard for the bank to do. I, I hope that was and I don't know the, the, the you know, there, there is an anomaly here of the things that would employ a lot of workers, uh, the world looks at and says, uh, this is just too harmful for the, for the environment. Uh, and so the World Bank probably is not going to be a leader in that, in that sector. Thank you. Um, so Fernando Serpa from Walmart asks, um, any comments you have about other ideas for foreign exchange generation um, other than USMCA? I guess that goes to kind of a world trade discussion. How do we increase um, 
trade? So, so what we know is that people across Latin America and the Caribbean, when they have a private sector system and a governmental system that facilitates their efforts, meaning education and then uh, some kind of job training and then uh, the, the availability of a job, they do really well. And so we know that there are hundreds of millions of people, <coughs> excuse me, in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean who are, are, are very profitable to themselves. They can generate an income because we know uh, when they're placed into uh, job opportunities, how well they do. Uh, and so uh, that just dr draws me to the idea countries, each country should look inside itself and say, why is it that our people are so talented uh, and yet they aren't allowed to take this job because of this rule or their, their, the tax system disadvantages them for this or uh, women and girls are kept in the bottom rung or whatever the, you know, all the various uh, uh, problems that are that become apparent. So we should redouble our efforts to to uh, uh, look at each part of the sectors of countries and say what might be the obstacle. You know, it used to be uh, the banks wouldn't lend to new businesses and certainly not to businesses that didn't look like the where the people didn't look like the banker looked like. Uh, and so that's that's been reduced some, but that's still an issue. And on down, you could go through a lot of things. Wow. State-owned enterprises are one of the challenges because they block and crowd out the private sector. So I think we should work on all of those in each country, including in the United States. So there are a lot of questions and we're running out of time. So I'm gonna try to look for the ones that you haven't already touched on. Um, this one comes from Laura Dashner um, Serrano. Um, are you, the World Bank, advising governments on how to strengthen their healthcare systems? Um, and if so, what do you see as the role of the private sector in this? Yeah, great question. So this is something that uh, hundreds of people in the World Bank are working on, including in Latin America. And I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert in that. What we've done in our uh, our COVID response. So starting in uh, March, I said to people, "Look, this has to be done differently from normal. We need lots of programs. They don't have to be huge, but they have to give us a framework." to work in countries. So I mentioned, you know, we have 104 countries where we have legal documents that set up the ability of us to help the country buy the equipment like personal protective equipment that they need. And they're funded, these, these are funded programs actually up and running in, 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 in countries. So it was a really fast energetic response. You know, people at the World Bank are burned out because they've been working from home like, 24/7 uh, in in order to uh, make this progress. So we have available for countries that are that are that need let's call it equipment or things that you can buy. There's a framework for that, and there there can be co-financing from the advanced economies and also from Inter American Development Bank, for example, to expand programs where that's needed. So that's one kind of approach. And now we're moving to this next uh, phase of the COVID response of identifying within the healthcare systems where there can be some strengthening. For some countries, that means the each country is kind of different. Some countries are short of nurses, some short of doctors, some don't have the computer systems to, to actually do a bill or to, to get money back from the government. And so we do a lot of work in capacity, uh, strengthening uh, for for countries, um, and so I have to kind of turn it back that it, we're involved in uh, actively in healthcare in many of the countries of Latin America, but the the programs are different in each one. So we have a bunch of questions left, but two minutes. One was about corruption and what the World Bank is doing. And another one was asking, uh, and that was from someone from Control Risks. And then we had another question really about um, um, about uh, specific um, actions that you're taking um, to tackle the gap between the very rich and the very poor in Latin America, which you touched on already a little bit, but I don't know 
Let me t t say two, two things. One is transparency is so important. This is a big World Bank initiative and we're making progress. We have a new website that went up about 10 days ago that's just transformational because it finally gives data on what the governments are doing to take on uh, debt. And that was one of the sources of corruption. And so that's an active uh, addressing of it. And as far as then inequality, I think uh, transparency and uh, reduction in corruption can help a lot with inequality. And the other thing I'll mention is just the availability of jobs, uh, allowing people to take jobs in different sectors that they've been kept out of. You know, this labor mobility is going to be a critical area for each country. Absolutely, um, it's gonna be critical. And, and with our one minute left, role of the G20 in all of this? Uh, uh, you know, historically, I haven't been such a fan of big international conferences. Uh, I have to say that the G20 that met in, uh, uh, the finance ministers met in April and have have uh, endorsed the, uh, uh, the debt initiative and the transparency initiative that we're working hard on. So right now, I'm a great fan of the G20 and they've been vital in this. China is fully joining in the transparency initiative, so that's good, and that's through the G20. So this is this is a positive uh, movement on this because this is a well, Susan, you you know better than better than all of us. Debt for forty years has been this uh, this uh, Achilles heel of development because it wasn't transparent. So I think we're making progress now, and this is going to be so important going forward. With that, um, I want to thank you, David. Um, as always, you've given a great set of comments. You've been super generous in answering questions. Um, and we hope we can continue this dialogue with you and everyone else. For our participants, I want to thank each one of you for joining us today. And I want to wish everyone and their families health, safety, and a wonderful July 4th virtual um, weekend with lots of social distancing, but lots of fun. Thank you so much, David, for spending this time with us. Nice to see everybody. Nice to see Fabulous. you. Thanks. Let me just uh, close oh, very Harris. Briefly, no, nice. David, thank you for your terrific comments, your kind words about us, Susan, your fabulous moderating, we really appreciate that. And I simply wanted to uh, remind everybody that our next session that's confirmed, this was the president of Chile, Sebastian Piñera, that will be July 28th. So we're looking forward to that. Please register for that as soon as the registration materials are available. And one final time to thank our sponsors for their very meaningful support during this very difficult time. So that uh, that is something that we take uh, note of your generosity and, and really appreciate that. Everyone, thank you for joining us for the second plenary session. We hope to see you again soon, David and Susan. Thank you again for a fabulous conversation. Bye, bye all. Bye all. Okay.